Hello, thank you very much for your invitation. And today my presentation is on building a new structural heart program. Here are my disclosures. So a bit history about structural heart. So the first TAMI was performed in 2002 and the first mitral clip mitral tear was performed in 2003. Many first in human and transcaptal mitral valve replacement, transcaptal valve interventions have been performed and now in 2023, over 2 million TAVI, 200,000 mitral tear, 3,000 tricuspid tear, over 1,000 transcaptal mitral and tricuspid valve replacement have been performed around the world. My journey with structural heart back, dated back in 2010 when I finished my residency in Toronto was my first exposure in Canada and Germany. And then after that, when I went to Mount Sinai, the U.S. Cobalt Pivotal Trial was performed. 2012 to 2016 marked my first journey in launching and building a TAVR program at Westchester Medical Center. And by the time I finished, we were doing around 140 TAVR a year, 40 mitral clips, with no stroke or major vascular complications in over 200 consecutive cases, including many first in human transcaptor tricuspid and mitral valve replacement cases in the U.S. or the tri-state region. After I went to Mount Sinai from 2017 to now, we offer a full service structural heart program at Mount Sinai, over 500 TAVIs a year, almost 100% transfemoral, with an observed to expected mortality ratio less than 0.4, less than 1% major vascular complication, less than 2% stroke. And we've now done over 100 tier TMVL and TTBL cases a year. And last year we did over, uh, over 3,500 TAVI in my own career over 600 mitral tricuspid tear, TMVL, and TTVR. Now, if you look at the United States, the total TAVR volume has now overseeded SAVR way back in 2018. And at the same time, the number of TAVI volumes uh, have grown in the United States. A number of cases now over 100,000. And you, at the same time, mitral tear has now surpassed isolated mitral repair in the United States as well back in 2019 and the number of mitral tear volume and size are only growing in the United States. So how did catheter-based intervention succeed? First of all, is procedural safety. Second is clinical efficacy. And you, of course, you see an explosive growth of evidence, innovations, the broad range of technology, refinement and sterilization of techniques, and now advances screening and procedural planning and imaging. So the current reality is that transcaptor valve therapy rapidly becoming the default or preferred treatment for valvular heart disease, the number of centers are growing, increasingly competitive environment, and the role of surgeons, unfortunately, in structural heart is diminishing. So how do we build a new program? I'm speaking, obviously, from a perspective of a surgeon, but this goes to apply to any uh, clinician out there. You need to first build a championship team. You need to secure institutional resources to support your mission. You need to understand the market and regional dynamics, provide clinical excellence, and offer exceptional service. The heart team has evolved now to be patient-centered approach, where you have a true multidisciplinary collaboration. So it's no longer just a cardiologist or surgeon, but you have imaging expert, cardiac anesthesiologist, heart failure specialist, dedicated coordinator, and other specialty consultants all involved in this patient's care. And so how do you build a championship team? First, you need to align and share the common vision, mission, and goals with your team. And you need to leverage it to other strengths, not the weaknesses. Of course, any big program, existing program, new program will have personalities. So you need to set aside or at least manage your own ego and agenda as well as others. The bottom line, you want to protect the patient, but also the program itself. And as an individual, as a leader, you need to be affable, able, and be available. And you need to be leading from the front as well as from behind. So here's an example that I recently became an incoming editor-in-chief of Jack Case Reports. And you can see I intentionally and strategically selected my deputy editors to be both women, one senior and one mid-career, and also associate editor from a very broad geographical ethnic, gender, and content expertise backgrounds to complement what I do not have, but at the same time with different career stages such that they will be able to build on each other 
to be able to mentor the early career people as well as working with senior career people as well. And so this is very important in terms of showing to the world what you try to articulate in your vision, you really mean it and you deliver. To secure institutional resources, you need to see sweet buying and support. There's no ifs and no buts about it. And it's not just talking about physical infrastructure. You obviously need the space to be able to do your cases, but also personnel. Remember, a room is as good as it is if you don't have the staff to support the procedures and the post-op and pre-procedural care. The workflow is very important. You don't want to get bogged down by inefficiencies. You need to proactively market your program and go outreach to your cardiologists and your internists and others. And of course, you need to innovate so that you are at the forefront of the technology and the program to maintain your competitive edge. So to understand the market, you need to look at the demographics. For example, our patients draw from not just New York City, but also actually the entire tri-state area. So you need to understand where these patients are coming from, where your referral base are, are they affiliated with other hospitals? What are your competitions? Uh, what are other centers doing? Are they doing as well as you are? Do you have a competitive edge to them? What are the health economics? Is your program financially viable and sustainable? How do you figure that out? You're not just a physician. You need to be a business owner and manager as well. Everything at the end of the world, uh, at least in the United States, comes to the bottom line. So how do you differentiate in this kind of competitive environment against a competitor? To do that, you have to provide clinical excellence. There's no if any way about it. You need to inst institute best practices. So when I first started in Westchester, that's what I did. You learn from the best, what's published out there, what's the latest evidence, and you put that into place. You, you need to put in care pathway so that you streamline the workflow efficiency without compromising safety. Build a database. If you don't have database, how do you track your outcomes? How do you know what's going on in the procedure? And this database can become a goldmine in terms of academic productivity. And that's how we will succeed, build on what I have with Westchester and what I have now. We now be able to use this database to do all kinds of interesting research. Pay attention to details. You'll be surprised how just attention to details can get you out of trouble, can get you what you need to do to be able to perform the procedure safely and efficiently and how you can achieve excellent outcomes. Be honest, be your, to your team and to yourself, and you always can do better. There's never a case that is too simple. There's always something to learn. There's always something to teach to your peers and your trainees. And it's, at the end, make all the results available and visible to all. You have to be transparent, and if you do a good job, make sure everyone knows about it. Now, the other thing, of course, at the end, this is a service industry and you have to provide exceptional service to your patients and families. And they're almost always right. Don't argue, listen. There's always a story behind them. You need to provide concierge model as well. This day and age will have to be have a 24 seven available. You cannot just be after hours, have the patient family call the answering service. No one picks up the phone, you leave a message, especially something urgent. So what I've done over my career has been provide a work with HIPAA, privacy, uh, protected cell phone to your, give that number to your patient and family. Believe me, they're not gonna abuse it. They're not gonna take advantage of you and try to call you at odd hours just to ask for a mundane question. They're very respectful. But when they need you, you should be made yourself available. And believe me, that's what will stand apart. I've been told many times, we've never seen a doctor who can answer text messages to call so quickly, no matter where they are in the world. And this day and age with the digital world, you can communicate wherever you are. Even you are 6,000 miles away on the other part of the world, you can still respond timely and you can delegate and reach out to your team to respond to urgent needs as necessary. So this is very important to have this kind of personalized approach that I think is very much lacking now in modern medicine. You want to streamline service and care. You don't want the patient to come back multiple times for multiple visits. You want to have to be able to provide top level care to differentiate yourself. And as I mentioned before, close the communication loop. Talk to your cardiologist, talk to your internist or pre primary care, whoever refer to you, let them know how things go, let them know what the game plan is, be consistent and make a common recommendation so they don't get confused by multiple opinions. It's very important to have one direction of your communication and that might be you. So final thoughts is to build a structural heart program, you need to find a vision 
commitment, organization. You need to be savvy politically, and you need to put in the hard work. And as a leader, as a, you need to be able, affable, available, but also flexible in how you handle situations. Align your vision and goals with the institutions and get your team's buying takes time, patience, and perseverance. But it will pay it off if you can demonstrate your success. And finally, always have a close friend or confidant to ask tough questions, share both your successes and failures, so that whether that your spouse or one of your close friends from childhood, you need to have that individual to be your sounding board. And don't be afraid to reach out to that person. On that note, I want to thank you very much for your attention and opportunity to make this presentation.